Get started now. Yes. Okay, right. first of all, I'd like to tell you about what's coming next month. Joanne Moody will be talking about adhesive challenges with wearables. Uh, there are a lot of wearables that are attached to the skin. Uh, could be a, uh, on the chest, but it could be anywhere else. Uh, a lot of devices use adhesives. And adhesives with skin, uh, there are a lot of challenges. And this is what Joanne is an expert at. So this should be a very interesting talk. Uh, as I mentioned, after the presentation, I'd like to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves and to meet others. And keep in mind that networking is one of the most important things you can do. Uh, this is something I learned quite a few years ago and it had a dramatic impact on myself and my company. And whether you're an engineer or somebody who specializes in meeting people like a salesperson, uh, having a good network is valuable. So we'd like to try and help you develop your network. This is a chance to listen to a brief introduction from each of the people who are attending. For those who wish to, you can spend about 10 or 15 seconds saying your name and why you're an interesting person to get to know. And you can listen to what the others say and we will facilitate the follow-up at the end uh, if you don't have their contact information, now you can reach people who are in Meetup directly, but Brian and I will make sure that you can contact anybody that you want to network with. Absolutely. So today, pardon, Brian? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, agreeing with you. Okay. Today, we're fortunate to have Jessica Ching. She's going to talk about how to successfully bring a product to market. And she's got a lot of experience in this area. She's an expert in marketing, both for medical and consumer products and other areas. And she's got expertise in a lot of different areas in marketing, product development and adoption, market assessment, brand strategy, product launch and introduction, marketing communications, and operations. So this is broader than your typical marketing person. Um, so let's... Take it away, I'll stop sharing my screen. And Jessica, go ahead. Hi everyone. It is a great day today and I'm really excited to be here speaking to all of you. And it looks like we're gonna have 30 people online, which is really awesome because I'm gonna share with you some of the things I've learned over my career and uh, working um, in three industries, three different industries, doing product development and marketing. But I'm also excited to hear some of your experiences as well. So I'm going to ask Brian to put up some slides. They're mostly just little visual cues that you can look at as you're listening to me. Um, let me admit these two people while Brian's putting up the slides. And uh, we'll get started. All right, so um, let me share. Here we go. And let me give this a PowerPoint view here. All right. All right. There we go. So you probably saw on the uh, little blurb that went out about the summary about what I'm talking about. The first line says, is your R&D on mute? <laughs> Which is pretty <laughs> apt for this meeting as we were sort of fiddling around with the controls. But I think that's a really great way to describe what sort of in a package, what we're going to talk about. So if you move to the next slide, I had been thinking about what it is that we all wanna to do today in our lives. We have these dreams when we are all in Silicon Valley, we live in this Mecca of just great innovation. We wanna build a team, work a startup life. I was gonna say live a startup life, but we all know that living a startup life means you're gonna be working a lot and then build something that just hits a home run out of the park and create a legacy. That is, uh, I think a lot of our dreams, and it's what I'm going to be talking about today to try and help you get to that. Next slide, please. So this is just a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a product development and marketing and business unit uh, manager, as, as Walt mentioned. Um, 
And I am currently focused um, in the area of medical devices. So in my career, I've worked in several different industries. I started out in automotive product development. Then I moved to computers and consumer electronics. And then about 15 years ago, I moved into medical devices, always on the consumer medical and the consumer health side of devices. And that is really where I play and where my heart is. So you'll hear some of my references for this. Um, it's also actually a great area of opportunity, especially with the convergence that we see in these days with consumer devices and medical devices. They are becoming practically one and the same. So let's move to the next slide where I wanna talk about new technology. So when you read about this meetup, you read about how new technology can enable that new product that you want to build, that home run that you wanna hit, that dream that you wanna fulfill. Technology is exciting, it's innovative, it's full of possibility and potential, and it is definitely an enabling force. It can be just one component or even a small software advance or put together an entirely new system. Sometimes we have leapfrogs, especially we see that these days. Technology is sexy and needed, but it is really also the backbone of our society. Yet all of these new capabilities don't at all guarantee that we'll have better products <laughs> that result in more sales, profit, experience, or brand value, and therefore not necessarily guarantee, excuse me, not guarantee a way to fulfill our dream. So the question here is how do we leverage technology? Can we leverage these tools to bring something faster, lighter, more seamless, easier, better value, or even just what we all really want, which is more enjoyable. Next slide, please. Well, that leads me to this topic here. Um, I think if you hit enter a few times, all the rest of the reasons will come out. So where is the opportunity? And the opportunity struck me actually comes out of some of these lessons of failure. Um, I pulled up an analyst view. They had interviewed 111 startup postmortem since 2018. And here are the top nine. You see that the answer here might well be number two, not just all nine of them, but specifically number two, because I think a lot of the failures here in the gray are also related to number two. Um, you, you, I wanted to point this out as well. Um, if you look at this top nine list, it's certainly things that we've all heard about, but you notice that number two is no market need versus number nine is actually a poor product. It's not at the top of the list. So where do we start given this opportunity? Let's go to the next slide. You won't be surprised to hear a marketer say that you should start with your customers. And we know this, we know we're supposed to build for our customers. We know we're supposed to listen to them. We know that we're supposed to take their, their needs and their wants and, and considerations in, but really how deeply we do it and how far broadly across the entire spectrum of our business do we do this? Do we even go to the extent of validating uh, what they say they believe or what they say they want or they need and then move ahead with development? And then do we check and validate again? And then do we do that again? because really doing this opens the gate for each new phase of development. So one of the key points that I'm gonna keep pounding in here is that talking to your customer and understanding your customer and understanding your market and taking their needs into account is not only broad, it encompasses everything that you do in your business, but it happens at every stage of development, especially at the keys. Now, I wanna make a point here that you don't wanna to wait to get to your MVP to check if you're on track. Because by then, you will have spent a lot of money and time and resources. Your customers and their needs and the entire focus ideally would be woven into each part of your development plans so that they're really an inseparable part of the fabric of what you're creating. Next slide, please. So I'd like to move right into this. This is a key action that I call it. Check the market, define your competition. And here's the point, to make sure that you identify your customers or your competitors, excuse me, as your customers see them. Because what you believe is a competitor might be different from what your customers believe are competitors. Your competition can be direct and indirect. 
And the reason I have a picture of this Miata here is when we were doing the development of this car, it's the single most successful car in the history of the automotive industry by sales of a single model. So this car ran for a long time. I think it was 10 years before the update came out. So it had a long time to do that. But in the early days when the car was very hot and selling for over sticker price, we wanted to make sure we were in line with the competition because there's a lot of feature for feature matching and price to price and that type of thing that goes on. So we got together a group of maybe around 30 car enthusiast opinion leaders who are the early adopters that had first bought the car. And I wanted to know, what else did you consider in addition to buying this Miata? So these image leaders, of course, are the, the spokespeople for your brand. They're the ones that have the most money. They could buy a lot more, but they choose your product. So I wanted to know, did they consider a Mustang convertible? At the time, there was a Chrysler convertible on the market, an RX-7 convertible, even I think a Porsche convertible, there weren't that many, maybe even another British Roadster. What do you think they said? Which car did they pick? Well, the first answer that came out was a trip to Cabo. I said, no, 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 <laughs> transportation. So the next guy said a pair of jet skis. And then the next guy said, well, I, can, I was going to buy the car or a supercomputer set up in my living room so that we could have an in-house gaming network. Very interesting. And basically went around the room and had another group of people three hours later, and they said the same thing. Basically what we found was the quote, competitors to the Miata was other recreational purchases in the 10 to $15,000 range. So that is a really great example. I've never forgotten that about how a customer defines its competition. And it might not be the same way that you think of it. Next slide. So this is a graphic uh, from somewhere that I pulled out and it's a market analysis for smart clothing. So that's not necessarily what I'm gonna talk about today, but for products other than something like a Miata, which is a very aspirational purchase, you still need to know where you're going to compete. It's pretty unusual that you have a $15,000 piece of transportation and it competes with a trip to Cabo San Lucas. Uh, most products compete a little bit more directly in their segment. And from the graphic that you can see here, um, even within that, there can be a lot of competitors. Um, this one is segmented by type of competitor. But assessing your market landscape is really a first step in getting to know your customer because who is playing in the space and how far they are and how quickly they might be moving toward your space tells you a lot about people who could be your customers too. So you want to know who else, uh, who, who else, meaning what other companies or products are entering your market space? Is it something where people are coming in quickly or is it something where it's fairly, you know, a, a slow pace? Um, what are they offering? What are these other companies and products? What are they offering? How are they positioning themselves? And interestingly, also, who are they targeting? What does their product portfolio and their roadmap look like? Um, that's a very interesting, some companies stay very broad or very uh, narrow pure play and others go broad. But if you dig through that, you can often find some interesting strategies in that. Um, another thing I look for in a market landscape is what kinds of alliances that companies have formed or are likely to form. I also look at their strengths and their weaknesses. And most importantly, I look at uh, so for example, in the middle of this, I probably would have put a big yellow circle where my product would be. What is my position relative to these other players? And I think these positioning maps are among the most useful of all types of tools. So it really helps you get to your customers and to get a view of what your customers are doing, who they might be and how you might find them. So if we go to the next slide, let's talk about customers directly. Um, there are all sorts of activities um, to be conducted around customers, um, assessment, targeting, segmentation, profiles, all kinds of testing, both in the product itself, the concept, um, even the messaging and the positioning. But it, it you know, this is a, a broad range of activities. And most people ask me, well, where do I start? And I think 
for me, the place to start, a good place to start is with a market uh, requirements document. You may have heard of this term in MRD, which lists all of the types of activities um, and comprehensive around the forces that are likely to impact your product in the market. Um, you would look at the background of an industry or a market, um, which will point to the trends and why the, the needs that you feel that are your, pro your product is solving, uh, why they exist. Um, it really alludes to a target customer persona or profile. And this would be an actual representative person that helps you visualize the needs of the segment and how big of a problem and how much pain they're in that would cause them to look at your product. The image I have here is actually uh, three friends of mine actually reviewing an actual product and finding out different things about the product themselves. But this is pretty apt to show this. But this can also point to your uh, MRD can also point to the product concept, how it fills the need and how appealing um, the solution might be. The competitive landscape, as we saw in the previous slide, is also useful, as well as a really sound product positioning and strategy, as well as a business model. So there's a couple of things that I want to dig into here about, um, for example, the business model. So you might think that this is kind of early to be looking at a business model. Typically, an MRD is done very early in the process. And it usually comes before the PRD, the product requirements document that has all of the specifications to which you build. But my philosophy on this has always been to enter into these thinking um, as early as possible. You know, for example, you might be thinking that product positioning is just a marketing activity that you would do downstream when you're ready to launch. But think about this, if you're going to position your product, but you've built it to be a very robust platform, um, and yet all of the partners in this space are looking for something light, easily integratable, um, maybe inexpensive, maybe quick, uh, quick for redevelopment, um, easy for the, uh, the user to use, but you've built a complete robust platform, your position is going to be pretty difficult to sell downstream. So a lot of the activities um, that you undertake in an MRD, a market requirements document, have to do with all of these elements of customer that should help you downstream. Some of them absolutely should be done early, the targeting, um, identification of customers and customer segments, um, and the research, which actually can be done pretty easily uh, from a secondary source. So I do spend a lot of my time pulling together lots of different sources of research for putting together MRDs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You may have heard of a process called lean product process. This is another paradigm for driving product development. It's somewhat similar to a market uh, requirements document, but if you do use the lean model, make sure you don't leave out some of the key things like relative positioning and perception of the product. Um, the MRD, I, I feel compared to a lean product process has a wider lens and looks at more, more and more variables and the components of the market, including sideways competition. And in some ways, you know, I would have considered that pair of jet skis to be sideways competition. So anyway, um, I think the overall, the overall message here is to use customer uh, research and documentation to really truly uncover all of your opportunities, challenge your assumptions, and to validate your plans. And these are the plans by which you're going to be investing in. Um, it is very expensive. And we all know this, we've all tried to hire people to join our development team. It was very expensive to put together a development team. It takes a lot of time and resources. Really the last thing you wanna do is to throw that away. What you really wanna do is to have the highest possible chance of getting those wins that we originally talked about. So I'd like to move on to the next slide um, and show you a little bit of an example um, of customer. So we of course always wanna develop our products for customer, but the customer is actually not a person, but a group of people. 
And although they have some similarities, they also have differences. This is why we create market segmentations. So in building products, um, we all understand that we should build a product for our customer, but to build a product for a complete different segments is a, taking it a step further. And really in a lot of ways, it's a way to validate the assumptions that you have about the device or thing that you're building and want to bring to market and how it will appeal and specifically to who. So it really kind of forces the issue. Um, this here is a stack of products. They were all uh, basically a communications bridge from one product to another. And it is, uh, as you can see from the kind of roughness, this is a 3D printed model. And because of this uh, capability and technology, this company was able to build several of them for a number of different segments. But, you know, unlike a 3D printed offering, it often does take a lot of resources to build a product for each segment. A lot of times you have to prioritize, but when you go through this segmentation process and listing out the different needs for each different groups of customers and what the product will look like, a lot of times you can get a better idea of where it is your product is most likely to fit. And as well, where your company's capabilities might be able to shine. You know, for example, um, you have a range of let's say you have three variants of a product that you could build, you can probably only afford to build one and maybe a second one. And your company is really good at miniaturization. Well, if you look at all the variants, one of those may lend itself to the skills that you have, you have in-house and that you can actually go to market with and have a higher chance of winning. So um, I just wanted to mention because there was a post by Valer recently about power supply, and it actually spurred me to make a note to Walt and saying, hey, I know of some products that were changed because of the availability of new power. So if you look at all of the variants of this little product here, um, advances in power supply as well as new firmware were the drivers for it. So let's dive into that a little bit deeper on the next slide. So these five variants of the product, and I think there were more of them because they have some of the old ones and the original ones, and even a third brand um, were designed for each segment. Each of these products was designed for the target customer's highest priority. And I wanna say here that I pulled this off the website for this product, and they actually wrote these words in quotes. So they really sort of stepped into the shoes of the customer. They took their voice. So if you want to wear the device on your wristband, it's like it's super mini sized, Pico would be your right choice. So you could see the customer standing there in the shoes. I would like to keep my device on my watch band. So for each of these things, the product was optimized for that person's needs and wants. Um, Another thing I wanna say about this, um, if you can afford to, and it's in your development budget or the tools that you're using allow you to build this many variants, um, you would also wanna size the segments. Now this would be true as well if you only can build one of them. You wanna know of these five segments for this product, how many customers are there for each color? How many red, blue, green, yellow customers are there? And that can help you make that choice. But by understanding all of these underlying needs, that is really um, a driver for that. So next slide, I know this question's coming up because I ask it sometimes, how much does all this stuff cost? So it sounds like a lot of money to find out all this stuff about customers. And I will say, yes, there is an investment upfront and it should be a noticeable about a part of the budget. But I'll tell you why that cutting back can be risky. Um, it's very expensive to be wrong. Do you remember of the original slide number two, the, the nine reasons, top reasons why startups failure, fail? Lack of product market fit. Uh, it's very costly to scrap and redevelop and relaunch. And even worse, depending on what your situation and what your market is like, your time to market is going to be severely hit and your sales will definitely impact uh, in some industries, you may not have another choice. Um, for example, in medical devices, and I know both myself and Valera do a lot of work with medical devices, um, you often we will not have that shot. Uh, it takes so long to go through the clinical trials process 
and to get the testing, uh, the validation done. And by the time you do that, you're completely out of money, just will have no shot. So it's true that it does cost a lot, uh, both upfront. And then remember, we said that we want to do customer validation at each key step before we undertake the next phase of development. So through the development process. And then, of course, once you launch, um, there's a whole set of costs that have to do specifically with the launch and the starting to sell and generate direct demand. So I wanted to talk about the next slide, which is um, kind of an interesting comparison to make this very real about two companies and what is the cost of one company, I shouldn't say one of the companies did not incorporate the customer, but one of these two companies did a much better job of incorporating. So let's talk about this. Company A, um, the two companies are direct competitors. They are in a truly breakthrough consumer med tech market. Actually, this was the start of something called continuous glucose monitoring. Um, it's an industry that I'm very familiar with. A company A has deep pockets. They're mighty. They have a lot of resources for development and marketing and staffing. And on top of it all, they actually at this time uh, that this was true, which was 2007, they had a more technologically advanced product. Now, company D, small, scrappy, bootstrap. Now, I will say that I think both of these companies, uh, they came to market in a similar amount of time. Uh, and we're on the comparison slide with the company uh, A and D. Uh, they came to market at around the same time. And I do think both of them actually missed the mark as far as the customer. Um, it was very interesting. They both targeted, no surprise, the doctors who prescribed their products. And what it turns out is that the health consumers and just social networks were taking off at the time was actually a much more powerful source of promoting a product and finding out about a product. Um, it was also uh, the product development itself was really slanted, really needed to be slanted toward the user, which was maybe 15 minutes in a doctor's office every six months, but 24 seven the rest of the time in the consumer's own home or environment or wherever they happen to be. So what happened here? Company D went for broke. They made tons of little changes. They talked to people. They filed, we filed tons of supplements to get those changes through approved by the FDA, which is required for that to come to market. We revised all the user manuals. We made sure that a sixth grader could read them. We put colors on the instructions for use and big illustrations and just one fold out. Company A on the other hand, dug in. In fact, they took the opposite effect. When the customer said they didn't understand things, they added pages to the user manual, which ended up being eight and a half by 11, around 132 pages, I think was when it hit the max. Um, it kept hitting the wrong segments. It would not make the updates to the product. Now, granted, there were some serious quality issues that had to take place, um, especially when you're dealing with a regulated medical device. But in the end, um, company D embraced what the customers wanted and company A blamed the customers for it. So what was the result? You could probably guess who won the race. Company A runs into problems. They cannot make changes as the, neither its business model nor its approach to customers. They were forced to exit the market after just one year. And that is with a lot of money, a lot of resources, um, they had the better product, to be honest with you. I was working for company D at that time. So what is the cost of this? Um, not listening to the customer and really not being able to weave in the customer's views and the competition and what was required, which really at this time, the trend that was missed by both, but was adopted much more quickly once it came to market was the convergence of consumer electronics and medical devices. And this started around this time. So the inability to see that or to foresee that either directly through customer requests or just in the way that they told you, this is what I want. I don't want a standalone device. Customers hate standalone devices. I don't want to carry this separately. I want to be able to read it 
on my phone, or I want it to not have to charge with a unique cable. These were all things that were coming and you could see that. So the cost of this was company A had to scrap 100% of its development um, efforts. It had actually entered the market, but our sales target, our actual achieved sales was less than 5% of what we were expected to um, reach. They had to redevelop an entirely new generation product, um, especially because company D was moving ahead at a rapid pace. Company D is still on track a little bit uh, differently, a little bit slower during COVID, but up to this point, around every 18 months or so with a new product version, which is actually the same speed as consumer electronics products. Now I will say company A, they did relaunch and they did come back nine years later and they are strong, but there was this loss. So it's, I think the takeaway is if you don't have these deep pockets and the ability to withstand nine years of redevelopment, um, do it right the first time. It's really the better way to go. It's cheaper. Um, you will see the cost of doing this. Uh, and that's even before we get to the go-to-market. But incorporating all of these processes for customer voice, um, customer experience, customer demands into each and every part of your development process is the way to get that speaker off mute, to really hear that. So I'm going to get off my grandstand there and go to uh, one of the last slides here, which is actually a pretty big slide about getting to market. So you, you can tell that from the time and all, everything that I've spoken, I've focused a lot on the upstream part about the development part about bringing a product to market. And I think that's partly um, because we, we live in Silicon Valley and this is the hotbed for being able to do this. And frequently what I see is that where companies fail you know, they have their approved product or they have their MVP or they've got their, their device ready to go out the gate and it's kind of dead in the water because you can't go back. I mean, sometimes you can change labeling, uh, you can make the user instructions a little bit better with software. The more software you have, the more software dependent the product is, of course, the easier and faster it is to rev that product, even though you have less time to market. Um, but you can't go back. Once you have your product and it's done, it's done. Um, so this is why I focus so much on the upstream and just sort of in my career, I had the opportunity to go downstream. I've worked at an advertising agency where we really are generating demand and promoting the product, but the product is what it is. So this is why um, I, I hope it's obvious I've spent so much time talking about optimization and ensuring really good, strong product market fit. Now that said, there's a lot more that comes after that um, because two of the big buckets of expenses you'll have during the development process is one of them when you have all those checkpoints for customer validation. Um, but another one, of course, will come at launch where you have a pretty sizable spend just to get the word out to let people know about your product. And then there's the actually much greater expense of ongoing demand generation and promotion and branding. So I'm not gonna talk about the branding part today. Um, that's definitely downstream. And uh, if you've got the right product, you will find an agency to help you. There are plenty of them out there. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the go-to-market planning that you can do even before you do hit the market. Um, if the longer you wait, the more risk you could take on. Um, these go-to-market assumptions ideally would all be present in your MRD, the first thing we talked about, which is really your playbook and your plan for how the product uh, will be, how the product will exist and live in the market through its life. Um, you may, in fact, if you've done a good job on the MRD and you've even looked, for example, early distribution channels, which... I'm thinking, why would I do that before I even have barely started development? Think about this. Your distribution channel considerations may actually cause a need for you to modify your product. Um, we talked about the, the fat um, platform versus the skinny platform. I actually know of a company that they had... Their product was on market. They actually had to scrap it for um, supply issues. 
they had to redesign the whole thing. They had a 53 week lead time um, and they had to redesign the whole thing. But, you know, and so obviously it's another year of development there, but if we had looked at, uh, we understand supply chain issues now with COVID, but if we had looked at all the considerations that we'll, it will actually take to manufacture and then distribute and then promote and partner with other companies to be able to really sell your product, it would make a lot of sense that you would want to at least have these in mind um, before you come to market. A really good live example uh, is back to consumer medical devices, which really are consumer devices used in a purely medical context. In fact, many of them are FDA approved. And coming to market um, downstream used to mean that, of course, you had to figure out who was going to pay for your product, right? Reimbursement, which insurance companies and how to get that. But within the consumer world and convergence here, there are a lot more new channels that are available, um, particularly in the field of digital health and lots of different partnerships that you might never have thought about before. I mean, we've all sort of heard about them in the last year or two, the partnerships, Walgreens, CVS, Amazon um, for medical products. But if you went backwards two years and looked at the start of your development and you saw the convergence of these channels, um, there might actually have been a different consideration that you may have made in your product specifications in order to uh, account for that capability that would give you an advantage when you do come. So um, even to the point of thinking downstream when you're looking at go-to-market, to what degree will your product be integrated with another product or used as a companion? You know, I mentioned that consumers, and we all know this, we all hate standalone products. Yes, I want the functionality of your product, but no, I do not want to carry another device. So if you are developing a product, um, to what degree does it need to be able to optimize the integration? And are you building that in, in time to really take advantage of that in the market? So there are some specialized considerations where you are really forced to think about your go-to-market activities at the very start of development. And this is particularly true in medical devices. So in medical devices, there is a thing called an indication and it's a statement that you file with the FDA. My device is for blue ink to be used on writing on rough surfaces like paper and cardboard. It can be used by humans aged 15 and up, et cetera, et cetera. Once you are approved by the FDA for this, that is the only thing that you can say about your product. You cannot change those words at all. They'll throw you in jail if you do. So when you think about this, if you're going to just sort of think, well, I think I know what people want and build the product and even get an FDA clearance for it. And then fast forward to the day that you're ready to launch this thing. And you're like, wait a minute, I need to be selling against this, or I'm just picking up things or this or whatever it has, but you can't do that because your indication for use and really the way your customer is going to be use your product is locked in. And that's another one of those, um, one of those unfortunate moments. So these are some of the reasons why you would think about go-to-market planning even before you get to an MVP or even if invested any sizable um, sum of money or any amount of resources. So if we do have, presumably now that we've all going to be discussing this, um, strong product market fit, and when we're ready to launch, we will have at least some pent up demand. We assume that we know who's gonna buy it because we've done our customer segmentation and we know what our competitors are going to do and how we're going to compete against them today and even in the next six months or a year. But now we also need to know, well, how are people going to buy this? So part of the go-to-market um, uh, needs that you'll need to figure out is how to generate demand and how to select partners to get to market. It's pretty rare, uh, kind of like standalone devices, other than big tech um, are rare. It's rare that a sole product um, is successful. And by the same token, it's rare that a company gets to market on its own without 
uh, distribution or sales partners. So, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought here, but I wanted to say that these are all things that you think about in your go-to-market plan. So you can start this um, early in your MRD and keep updating it as the market moves and you see activity and as you see uh, opportunities. One of the things that you should think about early, and I really wanna emphasize this because I come across a ton of products where people ask me to help them, but they hadn't thought about this. So they think they know who the customer is. And just when I say think, this is what kicks in next. Because if you're not sure, and you don't know who is going to pay for your product. This is really common, believe it or not, in medical devices. Medical devices, as you know, um, kind of like the health system, there is a long chain from the service to the actual patient, the end user. And it's quite convoluted in between. They've got insurance companies and durable medical equipment distributors and hospital accountability groups all through. It's not always clear who is going to pay. So I always tell people to envision who is signing your invoice. And you need to make sure that your product is positioned that way. So even though it's a medical product, for example, that might be uh, to help with an eye, um, the, the key decision maker in that sales process might be the finance department of the hospital. So you need to be able to message <clears throat> to these people and you need to understand this because that can have an impact on your product development as well as your overall marketing plans. So I think the, the last part I wanna mention is messaging and branding position. So of course, this is something that is often done at the end. We will develop a logo, a color scheme, uh, a position statement that will incorporate our unique value proposition. Um, but it is sometimes helpful to get this in early. The light platform, heavy platform, um, the medical devices where you really do need to understand where you're positioned in. And even, you know, for example, when markets converge, um, if you were not sort of aware of this trend or you were aware, but you didn't incorporate into your product, it might not be um, in the messaging of um, how you are presenting your product to your customers in all the different ways. Um, and, you know, all those viral uh, social media, as well as traditional means, uh, influencer groups are all valid, but in the end, you will have a message that you have to deliver to them to do demand and lead generation and create a funnel for your sales. <clears throat> so I think it's not a good idea to set up a media and a sales plan really early on, but it is good to have this in mind and to the degree that it will affect you. So I do think the specifics of getting to market and how early and how much you invest early or not, uh, and the specific tactics and techniques um, will vary with the product and the industry. And you know, having worked across a lot of industries, I've seen a lot of different changes. Um, but what this all means is that there's a lot of potential out there. I will say, um, I always, when I work with a client, I always hope, really crossing my fingers, that my competition is listening to a talk like mine and just blowing it off. And I'm like, yes, that'll give me a little advantage. But in within that, um, you've also seen some of the things that you can do to really kickstart um, your chances of getting to market and being successful and winning and fulfilling the dreams that you've had. So this is why I have my last slide as the bright future um, for all of you. And I hope that um, that is helpful and insightful to what you're going to be doing today or over the next weeks, months, or years. So thank you very much. Um, I had my chat on, I don't see anything in there, but I'm going to uh, turn this over to Brian and he's gonna basically moderate any questions or comments you have. I'd actually love to hear any experiences or even challenges you have to any of the information that I've presented. Hello, guys. Thank you, Jessica Ching, for again for your presentation. Uh, this is very insightful and, and exciting as well. We, we did get a couple of questions on the chat. Uh, 
Let's see here. So we have a question here from Dev. Uh, he says, thank you for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Dev. Uh, also, so his question is, can some company in the very initial, initial stage with low money budget and a printed part for a Pico form factor with connectivity to a software model running on a PC can use to get feedback from customers and use the customer feedback help to create engineering model that will be successful? Yes, yes, I do believe that there is um, marketing for every budget, um, including startups when there is not a lot of money around. So I know it is very common for startups to ask uh, the people kind of in their inner circle um, to test products or give their opinion. And I think, I mean, I think that's a that's the right concept. But one way to do it inexpensively is just to go maybe outside of your immediate circle. You know, I always use my mom as the example, or members of people in my family, or even in my circle, for example, who in my own tech circle, still friends of mine, but who are not tech savvy, um, who may struggle a little bit more um, and to get their opinion. That's the first thing. The second thing mm -hmm. I would suggest for you, Dev, is to try and formalize and quantify these opinions. So if you can create a survey or a form where you can see side by side everybody's opinions and you can more easily start to see trends. Um, and the third thing I would say is that, and I have been, I will agree that I am guilty of this as well, is have someone else look at your data. Um, because you, it's human nature, I think, to see what we want to see. And even though the survey results, you know, of course, they're probably cluster around something that's obvious and there's a few outliers. But I will say that don't discard those outliers and have someone look at that that has maybe a different view from yours or even uh, a different department. For example, someone on your team who's, who's uh, in finance or HR, that's more of their strength than it is in technical or engineering or development to look at that and what do they think about that? Um, so these are some of the tools that you can use um, without spending necessarily a ton of money. I think there are some other layers. For example, you can often reach out to people with surveys um, that are outside of your network and for a small amount of money, $5 maybe per person, you can get some input. Um, those are reasonable ways until you can really spend money to do a more uh, scientifically unbiased and maybe even a larger sample. But I think that's a good nice. start. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, no, that's a very good answer. Uh, and then uh, we also have uh, a question from Anne Gabbett Hughes. Uh, she mentioned it's really informative, but how does one know what you should integrate your medical device to? For example, the continuous glucose monitoring device, what else can it be integrated to? So um, the short answer to this is that all CGMs will operate from a phone. Um, in, I'll call this, this is Jessica's prediction, in 24 months, if your product does not work on someone's phone, it's dead. I see, yeah, that's a good. <laughs> But how do you know what to integrate to? I think was the root of your question. Um, and I will go back to my example of 2007 when company A and company D were really looking at their product, right? This was their segment. And it was a very, actually it's a pretty well-defined segment. It's for a specific type of type one diabetes and blood sugar monitoring. Um, but we were looking at the traditional way of bringing things to market, which is to kind of buddy up and make friends with the doctors and get them to prescribe and then distribute and pay through the traditional um, insurers. But I think today um, we have the ability to see trends coming from different places. And I would say that I think, although it wasn't necessarily very high on our consciousness level, like it is today, but the convergence of consumer devices and medical devices is pretty darn obvious. And it was starting back then. And if you read the tea leaves, so to speak, 
I mean, if you went out there and talked to people, it was already mm-hmm. starting. So it is a combination of sometimes more of that scientific research and other times it is following up on your intuition where, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, this is interesting. I just did three or four hours of internet research yesterday on published papers on a certain item of what my client wanted me to look at. I couldn't find anything. And I kept finding this other stuff and this other stuff. I'm like, why, why are you guys talking about this? Why are you talking about this? I want to know about A and you're talking about D. Does that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I had to write back to the client. I'm like, well, you know, we don't really have this ability to find information that doesn't exist, but I will tell you where the trend is going. Yeah. And this is from, you know, research publication. It takes two years to publish a paper. So it's out there. So to answer your question, Anne, um, you got to look around. And sometimes you have to look far from where you think your market is. So don't take your eyes off that. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah, it's, it's part of the foreseeing and being able to forecast, but you, you just never know. You, you got to follow the trend. <laughs> uh, if, do we have room for another question? Uh, any other questions? Yeah, there, there's another one. On the yeah. yeah, yeah. Throw them at me. I'm curious. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have one from Joanne. Uh, she says, can there be too much, too much customer feedback? Yeah. Just like there can be analysis paralysis. I do believe there can be. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, because, you you know, it's easy to do this. I've worked in consumer electronics. We build what the customer says they want, and then we launch it and they don't want it, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, this is part art and it is part science. Um, there's a science part and you have control over that. But the art part, interestingly enough, is something that people struggle with sometimes because you do... You, you are, you're using intuition and you're taking like, you're taking a risk in some ways, right? Um, yes. You're extrapolating mm-hmm. what you think where the trend is going to go and how fast, but this is all part of um, the secret of product development. So I think that one of the ways that you increase your chances of landing on the right spot is to broaden your view. So if your team has mostly, um, you're lucky if you have a bunch of engineers and technical people, because they're hard to get, but it is often helpful to balance sometimes with other people, even for example, like an operational person, um, a pure supply chain person, a finance person. And, you know, sometimes we say those people, we peg them into their little round, their round hole, right? That this is what they do. But I really do believe there's value um, in sometimes other people's opinions, because I have seen so many times when there's some little data point like out in the stratosphere and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's an outlier. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've so, got a question nice. for you, Jessica. Yeah. Um, how do you go about asking your customer in early stages when you're developing your MRD, how do you ask them about their needs? You know, everybody's heard about Henry Ford saying, well, my customers just wanted faster horses. So how do you come up with a car when customers are saying they want faster horses? Okay, so this is a great one. And I love your question, by the way. Um, first of all, there are some leapfrogs that it's very difficult to anticipate. Um, I think the car or the horse to the car was one of them. And perhaps even the move from Blackberry and um, uh, I'm forgetting what is Jeff Hawkins, um, his devices, Don't Blackberries know. and uh, Palm, Palms. Palm Pilots. Thank you. That was my favorite thing yeah. um, to the multimedia machine of the iPhone. That was something that was not easy to call. But a lot of times, here's how I do this. When I'm looking for the trend and I don't see one necessarily from research, start interviewing people and talking to them, ask them about their life. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to solve a problem in a specific area, right? And probably you've got a certain type of product in mind. So tell me about your life. What is your life like? Are you happy? How much time does it take you? What's the rest of your life like? Uh, Who else is in your life? So you start to build this sort of 
pixelated sketch and you're putting in one pixel at a time, sort of like, uh, I guess like Jeopardy, right? You got one letter at a time and you're like, oh, and you know, sometimes until the person calls it out, you don't see it, but sometimes you do. So that is one of the tools that I use is really just an understanding of lifestyle. And I do think actually for products, that is a very useful way to anticipate something that the customer themselves can't directly tell you, and they don't necessarily know they want or they need, but they do know they have these pains and these other things make them happy. And they have these constraints and these abilities, et cetera, et cetera. So you see where I'm going with this? So that can be um, a broad way to get into a space that your competitor probably not doing again, I always pray for my competitors to blow me off. That's the best <laughs> possible thing that could happen. Because <laughs> then I can help my clients win, right? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, um, very good. I, I'm glad everybody got a chance to do some networking. So uh, let me know if we're okay. Has everybody, everybody had a chance to grab the, the emails they wanted to grab? If I close now, will you be okay? Thank you guys again. Uh, you'll be able to see my email uh, for future reference and also the meetup link uh, where you guys can sign up and uh, be aware of the upcoming events that we have. Um, and again, if you guys have questions, feel, feel free to let me know. Uh, feel free to let Walt know. And, uh, and then we'll go from there. Thank you guys for joining again. Thank you very much. Hold on.